Well, I had the unfortunate opportunity yesterday to attend a funeral of a friend of mine and his wife. Let me tell you about Father or Pastor Wolfgang Chrismantis. He was Austrian. His wife was from Texas. I don't know how that happens. He was the senior pastor at the historic Red Church in Sonora. If you've ever driven on Washington Street, the main street in Sonora, there's that Red Church at the top of the hill, historic Red Church. It's a, it's a monument, and it's an active church, and he was, he was the pastor of that church. Now, it's an Episcopal church, and you might not, and I might not agree with everything that goes on, but uh, Pastor Wolfgang, as he, or everyone just called him a Wolfie, as, as Wolfie, um, as we know about him, that when his denomination was openly ordaining and installing men and women in openly um, sexually immoral lifestyles, when, the, when his denomination was doing that, he stood against them. He served that community for over 20 years. He was well-liked, well-respected, well-received there. He also had a heart for the poor. I was told that sometimes in Sonora it snows and there are street people, and I was told that he actually opened up this historic red church and just invited people to come in and sleep on the floor. Well, you can't really do that without causing some kind of ruckus, and so some church members said, no, 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 Pastor, you, you can't do that. This is our church. You can't let people sleep on the floor. So they came in, and they kicked them out and then locked the doors, and so he came back, and he unlocked the doors, and this went back and forth a couple of times until finally he went down there with some tools, and he removed all of the hardware from the church. <laughs> there was no way to lock the doors. So they, they kept coming in, and then finally a, a letter from the denomination came down and said, you know, uh, Pastor, you can't, you can't have people sleeping in the church, and so as your denominational authority, remember, this is a non-autonomous denomination, we are ordering you not to allow people to sleep in the church building. And he said, okay, we have to respect our authority. So he put up a big sign that said, no sleeping in the church, but 24-hour prayer is allowed. <laughs> so he was, he was a good guy He thought outside the box And, and again he was well loved and well received In the city of Sonora And he's going to be missed um, I went to his ser funeral service yesterday It was a two hour service That's why I wasn't at the, uh, the vendor fair for very long um, But hearing the stories It wasn't just um, a church thing Or a community thing It was a family thing He was well loved and respected by his children and his, their, his children's spouses and grandchildren. So, um, But here's what happened. He had had some heart problems and was seeing a doctor near Monterey. So him and his wife were driving back from Monterey when someone ran a red light. They were crossing an intersection. They had the legal right to cross. Someone ran a red light, smashed into them, but it pushed them into a, some, a semi-truck and he died uh, on the spot, and she died at the hospital just an hour or two later. And so they both went home to be with the Lord. Um, all I can say about this is that they're having a better morning than we are. So however, however good your morning is, they are having a better morning than you are having or I are ha and that I am having. One of the things that, that struck me about this story was that this pastor's family, this... Uh, this community, this church was robbed of its pastor. These children were robbed of their father and mother for one reason only. Someone broke the law. You see, we have a system in this country of, of roadways and signs and rules and regulations that were designed to keep these hundreds of thousands of pounds of vehicles of metal with explosive materials from crashing into each other. We have a system put in place so that you know you're supposed to drive on the right side of the road and that green light means go and, and, and red means stop and yellow means speed up, right? And all these different signs, it doesn't really mean that. But, you know, all these different, we have all these different signs and, and you might say, you know, I get frustrated that I have to wait for five minutes at this stoplight and I understand that. But the rules were put in place so that the community as a whole would be safe. And when we break these rules... 
Sometimes we get away with it, but sometimes we don't, and sometimes people get hurt. Well, that's what God did for these um, early people, for the people who have come out of Egypt. He established for them a set of structure, a set of laws that said, look, I'm going to lay down a, a nationwide set of rules. They're going to be fair. They're going to be workable. And if you follow them, you will thrive. You will be blessed. But if you break them, then people are going to get hurt. If you would, open up your Bibles to Exodus 20. And we're going to continue learning about the Ten Commandments. In fact, we will look at commandments number five and six today. Exodus chapter 20, starting with verse 12. I just have two short verses to read. Exodus 20, verse 12, from the Holman Christian Standard Bible. Here is commandment number five and six. Honor your father and mother so that you may have a long life and the land that the Lord your God is giving you. Verse 13, do not murder. Well, that was pretty easy. That was one of the shorter readings I've ever had to read from the scripture. Well, let's look at commandment number five, honor your father and mother. This commandment is not necessarily something that bodes very well with our culture. This fifth commandment seems to be antithetical to the way we think. Now, of course, we want our children to honor their parents, but as a whole, we seem to be pretty far off on this one. Let's look at a montage of some of the things that the scripture says about this issue of honoring your parents. The first one is Deuteronomy 27. Cursed is the one who dishonors his father or mother. And all the people will say, Amen. Proverbs 20, verse 20. Whoever curses his father or mother, his lamp will go out in deep darkness. Matthew chapter 10. A brother will betray brother to death and father his child. Children will even rise up against their parents and have them put to death. And finally, Romans chapter 1. And because they did not think it worthwhile to have God in their knowledge, God delivered them over to a worthless mind to do what is morally wrong. They are filled with all unrighteousness, evil, greed, and wickedness. They are full of envy, murder, disputes, deceit, and malice. They are gossips, slanderers, God-haters, arrogant, proud, boastful, inventor of evil, inventors of evil, and then listen to this, disobedient to parents. I find it interesting that Paul lumps in all of this wickedness, greed, evil, murder, gossip, and in that list is disobedience to parents. So quite clearly, this issue of honoring our parents is something that is close to the heart of God. And this issue is important to him, and I think it should be important to us. And so here are a few things I want you to notice about this fifth commandment. Now, if you have notes uh, in your bulletin, you can follow along. A couple of things about this first commandment. Here is the first one, is that this command was given to everyone, not just the kids. I think there's a temptation to open up the Ten Commandments and to say, okay, yeah, I need to not carve idols, I need to not murder, but here's one for the kids. Honor your father and mother. But remember that this story, the way it unfolded, two million people approached the foot of a mountain, and, and, and lightning came, for, came forth, a fire and thunder, smoke billowed from the top, trumpets were heard sounding, and then this voice came from the mountain. This was delivered to the people, all of the people, and it is not referring to children. So do children need to honor? Yes, of course they do. But this is directed mostly at adults. So this command was given to everyone, not to kids. Here's the second thing, and this is a little harsh, that the breaking of this commandment warranted the death penalty. In the Old Testament law, under this first covenant... To break this commandment was to be put to death. Leviticus chapter 20, verse 9. If anyone curses his father or mother, he must be put to death. He has cursed his father or mother. His blood is on his own hands. 
Now, that's kind of harsh, but it's there, and we have to deal with it. Here's another one. Check this one out. If a man has a stubborn and rebellious son who does not obey his father or mother and doesn't listen to them even after they discipline him, his father and mother must take hold of him and bring him to the elders of the city to the gate of his hometown. They will say to the elders of the city, this son of ours is stubborn and rebellious. He doesn't obey us. He's a glutton and a drunkard. Then all the men of the city will stone him to death. You must purge the evil from among you, and all Israel will hear and be afraid. Now, I don't know if you had a kid like this when you were growing up, but it's, is it me, or did every neighborhood have the one really, really bad kid? You see, in my neighborhood, it was a kid by the name of Richard, and Richard was bad, bad news. And I feel sorry for Richard. I don't know whatever happened to him. But a kid like that doesn't happen by itself. I'm sure the parents were involved. But I remember as a third grader um, for the first time and uh, having other third graders come over to his house watching pornography because he, his dad had had some in the house. And so Richard invited other third graders. And so we went over and saw that sort of stuff, things that shouldn't be seen. I remember Richard used to go take us to, we would go to grocery stores and, and he would teach us how to, how to run uh, interference while he stole toys. So he would, there would be like little G.I. Joe guys or whatever. And so I would stand here. And then, if, you know, while he was stealing something, if an employee came by, I would start coughing really loud. I would run interference for him. And one of the worst things that he did was there was a, an elderly lady on our block. And she was, unfortunately, uh, she was, you know, growing more senile as time went on. So he used to knock on her door and he would say, hey, I'm, I'm the paper boy. I'm here to collect. And being this loving, kind a, a lady that she was, she would say, well, how much do I owe you? And he would say, well, whatever, however much money he wanted that day, he would ask for it. She would give it to him. And then the next day she would forget that it ever transpired. And so he would steal money from her. Now, in, in our culture, a kid like that might end up getting transferred to a secondary school. He might get in trouble and end up in juvenile hall. But in the biblical culture of the Old Testament, under this first covenant, a son like that who would not submit to discipline, who would not change, would be taken to the city gates. And the elders would gather the evidence, and then they would lay down a judgment, and then all of the men of the city would grab stones, stones about the size of, I don't know, a baseball or something like that. And he would be put in a circle, and they would throw stones at him, until he fell down, and then they would take bigger stones and lift them above their head and smash them down, and this poor kid will, would die. And this would have been, watch the alliteration, a primitive, painful, and public death. But guess who was watching? All of the children of the city saw this. And the memory of that event would burn no, it would be seared within their brains. It would be something they would never forget. And my guess is, I don't have any historical evidence, but my guess is that this would probably only need to happen about every 10 years or so. Because every kid would need to see it once, and that would be the end of it. So this is another reason why, as Christians, we don't follow the laws of the Old Testament. We're under a different covenant. We don't put our children to death for disobedience. But this is how important of an issue it was uh, under this covenant. Now, as you are well aware, our culture teaches something drastically different. What I see so often is that parents want to be friends first with their children and parents second. When I believe the way to do it is to be parents first and friends second. Look what the writer of Hebrews says on this issue. He says, we had natural fathers discipline us and we respected them. Shouldn't we submit even more to the father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time based on what seemed good to them, but he does it for our benefit so that we can share in his holiness. No discipline seems enjoyable at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it yields the fruit of peace and righteousness to those who have been trained by it. In other words, 
There is the recognition that we have to discipline our children, and they might not like us for it. They might not like us during certain periods of time while they are growing up, but according to the scripture, later on, because they've been trained in this way, they will respect us as parents because we did it. And so as a parent, we can be friends now, but disrespected later, or we can be uh, a disciplinarian now, but respected later. And I think we know what we ought to do. There's also this idea that, you know, parents... We should just try to be understanding. There's no reason to lay down antiquated Puritan laws. Kids will be kids. There's nothing you can do. They're going to be young. They're going to be free and so on. And this idea that just let they're going to make the mistakes. So let's just stay out of the way and let them make it. But the scripture gives us a very different structure from which to proceed as parents, that we are in charge of teaching them biblical knowledge, not the pastor, not the Sunday school teacher, not the church, that we are supposed to be disciplinarians to them, and that this idea of, of children obeying their parents is so close to the heart of God. Now, here's the third thing, that this issue was and is the very foundation of a functional society. The Lord has set up culture like a brick wall. And each family unit is a brick. And so how do you build a nation, a culture? Well, you lay bricks and, and you connect those bricks. They're bonded together by what? By a similar culture that we all believe in one God and that we serve him. This binds us together. And so this wall is built up. Well, what happens is when there's uh, family problems, when there's divorce, then those bricks break. Well, does it affect the wall? Not really. But what happens if there's a brick here that breaks and a brick there that breaks and all the bricks start breaking? Eventually, the entire wall comes crumbling down. And so it really comes down to families. Now, the Lord has ordained it that families have roles. And I know this, isn't, this, isn't, um, this is offensive in today's culture, but, but families have roles. And it's talked about it in both the Old and New Testament. But one of the things that a family is supposed to do is to teach kids to respect authority. You see, if you train your children to respect you as a parent, then what's going to happen is as they grow up, they are going to have respect for other sources of authority. Now, I know some of you are teachers out there, and I, my hat's off to you. I know it's a hard job, but how many children do you deal with on a daily basis that seem to have zero understanding of having respect for authority? When we teach this fifth commandment, that they are to honor us, that spreads to every authority in their life. That here is a, a red light. That's an authority. You need to honor that authority. Here is, a, here is one of your teachers. You need to honor that authority. Here is a, a pastor or your Sunday school teacher. You need to honor that authority. And it starts with honoring the parents. And so here's number four. What, what exactly does it mean to honor your mother and father? It's kind of vague. And some of these Ten Commandments have been a little vague. Well, the first thing is, let me say that to honor is not to obey. There's a big difference. Now, again, we're not talking about children. Children have to obey. That's in the scripture. But as adults, this commandment does not tell us that we have to obey our parents. To honor them is not to obey them. And you might say, wait a minute, wait, wait, don't be telling my kids they don't have to. I'm just saying that as adults, we do not have to honor them. Now, you might say, wait a minute, but I have adult children still at home. Don't they have to obey me? I would say yes, but that's a landlord issue, not a parenting issue. Anybody who lives under your roof, if it's your roof, roof you get to decide the rules. And that's just, that's just, that's a landlord issue. But as adults... We don't have to obey our parents. Why? Because of Genesis chapter 2. In Genesis chapter 2, it says, For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother. Some of the old passages say cleave. There has to be a separation from mom and dad at a point in life. 
This is especially true when a new family is formed. And, and so it may be that you grew up in a house where your dad wanted you to be a baseball player, and that was important to your dad. You played catch with your dad, you watched games with your dad, you went to games with your dad, and his dream is for you to be a baseball player, but at a certain point you have to say, Dad, I love you, I respect you, but that's not my dream. Or your mom wants you to be a doctor right when you were born. She had this image. My son's going to be a doctor, but the Lord wants you to go into ministry. And you have to disobey your mom in that sense and follow the Lord into ministry. Or your dad wants you to follow in his footsteps, but you want to join the military. So we're not talking about obedience. We're talking about honoring. And when you establish your own household, then you have to have your own rules. And you have to apply those to your parents. I remember a friend of mine was telling me a story that um, his son moved out, bought his own house, had a coffee table, and he went over to his son's house, and they were talking, and his, the dad put his feet right on the coffee table, and the son said, sorry, dad, you're going to need to take your feet off. And, and the dad obeyed, but on the inside, the dad smiled because what his son was doing was exerting his authority over his own household. And so when you establish your household, you have the right to apply the rules of your household to your parents. And so it might be that a friend of mine uh, had a real strong view of Easter, and his mom used to come over and bring all of these Easter bunny gifts for the children. And, and the, the, my friend said to his mom, Mom, look, at, we're trying to teach our kids that Easter is not about bunnies. It's about the resurrection of our Lord, and you're welcome to come over. We're going to have a family meal, but please don't bring a lot of the Easter bunny stuff. We just don't want our kids getting used to that. And so the mom came, and she brought it over anyway, and he said, no, this is my house. You're my mom. I love you. I honor you, but in my house, we're not, and so there was a conflict there, but he was on the right side because it was his family, his house, and they were trying to honor the Lord. And so to honor is not to obey, and so I wanted to make that clear. But let's look at some specific ways to honor our parents. In the, in the Hebrew, the, work is, uh, the, the word for uh, honor is kaved, and it means to weigh heavily. Now, um, this summer I was working on an air conditioning unit, a seven-ton unit. It doesn't weigh seven tons. That refers to the volume of air. But I think it weighed about 1,000 pounds. And I was on top of this roof, and it was a slanted roof. This, this unit was huge, and we had to move it from one side to another. And there were pipes, and there were cables, and a slippery roof. It was raining. So we had these big iron poles, and four of us got under and lifted this thing up as high as we could, and then we had to walk it like this. I was on the down side, <laughs> meaning that if it fell... It's going to hit and then roll over on top of me. So as I'm carrying it, I am looking for my escape route. Like, so I'm walking, and I'm looking that I have to dive this way. And so we made it there. It didn't crush me to death, as you know. This thing was so heavy that I gave it the respect that it deserved. And so the Hebrew word to honor is to assume something is heavy, to assume something is weighty. And so that's the Hebrew version of uh, honor. In Greek, it's tamao, and it means to set a price or estimate a value. Now, I had a friend who had a Porsche. I'm not a car buff. I don't know. It was an, it was an old, it was probably 60s Porsche, and he had it redone, and it was his pride and joy. Well, when he went to the grocery store, he, he wouldn't go out unless it was raining, or unless it wasn't raining in clear weather. But when he drove this to the grocery store, guess where he parked? He parked way out there where there were no carts and no other cars to smash into it, opening their doors. Why did he do that? Because he estimated that the value of this car was so great that he wasn't going to risk it. So the Greek version of honor is to set a high price or a high estimate of value. And so we are to transfer that to our parents to... to to, to estimate them as being someone as valuable and what they say as valuable. Now, I know what you might be thinking. Nathan, my, my parents sinned against me horribly. And I'm not, I'm not being, I'm not kidding around. Like, they, they, my parents were evil people, and they've done me wrong. 
And you're telling me I have to honor them? I had um, two foster daughters, I guess this would have been 14 years ago, that moved in with us for a while. And the stepdad was uh, the perpetrator of abuse on these two girls. And so CPS brought them out, and they moved in with us for a while. Um, the problem was is the mom took the stepdad's side, which um, I think that we ought to take the side of, of, of what's right. If, 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 if the girls made it up, then that would be, you know, that's fine. But, but uh, they didn't. And she took his side, and they spent years dealing with this issue with, with their mother. And, um, and I've talked with them many times about how do we apply the, the fifth commandment to this situation. So these girls, both of them got married, and I was able to perform both of their wedding ceremonies. And they're, they're serving the Lord right now. But what they decided to do was they weren't going to send mom an invitation to the wedding because they frankly didn't want her there or her husband. So what they did is that they had the wedding, and then after the wedding was over, they sent a, um, basically a notice saying that, hey, we got married, and here's a photo, and they sent that to their mom because they felt like that was a way that they could honor her. And I believe when the older one had a child, she also would, would send a photo and say, you know, I'm not going to let you on Facebook or anything, but here's, I'm going to send you this photo. And so they made this effort to, to honor this mother, even though she did not deserve it. And so you, you, we can be separate from them, but still honor them. Now, there are some, there are some cultural things that we can do. Like, you know, send, like if, you're, if you're disconnected from your parents, you can send a Christmas card, a birthday card, photos of the kids. There's ways to be separate and say, I'm protecting my family from your influence, but I'm still going to honor you as best as I can because by doing so, I'm honoring the Lord. And you can speak respectfully to them and respectfully of them when you're around your children. You also can listen to what they have to say even though you might know it's complete garbage. I was told that the dumbest thing you could ever do in life was to marry a gal with whom you have not had sex. This is ludicrous. You have to test someone out to make sure that you're sexually compatible. And when you've established that, then you get married. That was the advice I got. And so I can smile and nod and listen and say, yes, I, I hear what you're saying, and then do what the Lord has called me to do. So we can honor, even though we might not, um, it might not be safe for them to be around. But here's the third thing, and this one's really hard. That we are, to, according to the scripture, to provide for them in the end. Now here's the good thing. If your parents are good, God-honoring people, then outside of some sort of unseen financial disaster, taking care of them will not be a problem. Why? Here's what the, look what the scripture says, Proverbs 13, 22. It says, a good man leaves an inheritance to his grandchildren. If you want to know if you're a good man, are you saving an inheritance for your grandchildren? And that's the Bible's standard. Now, again, we all understand that there are financial disasters, uh, Enrons, and, sort, and things of that nature. But overall, a good man is going to be prepared. A good man is going to save money his life, all of his life, so that when it's time to go, he's got enough to care for himself and then something left over for his family. So if you have God honoring parents who are following the Lord, not going to be a problem unless there's been a, a financial disaster. Or what should I say if they're in the ministry? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> now, you might say, but Nathan. I don't have parents like that. My parents have squandered their wealth. They have nothing. And I don't know what to do about that. Well, again, let's look what the scripture says. Paul, talking to Christians, support widows who are genuinely widows. But if any widow has children or grandchildren, they should learn to practice their religion toward their own family first and to repay their parents for this pleases God. He says, Christians, rather than letting the church or someone else take on the financial responsibility of taking care of your parents or grandparents, you, Christian, need to do this. 
you need to put your religion into practice. And then he says, it pleases God. He also says, it repays your parents. For some of you parents out there, you have small children, and you know the high cost, even not even small, medium-sized children. You know the cost that you have paid for raising these children, and, and you never thought you could sacrifice so much. Well, the way the system is set up is that at the end of your life, the role gets reversed, and they are going to take care of you in God's economy. You know, I used to lead worship and preach at this uh, senior center. I don't really know what to call it, but it was kind of the last stop for people. That people went here to be cared for and to ultimately to die. And it was an interesting gathering because some of the people there, they, could, they couldn't see, but they could hear. And some people couldn't hear, but they could see. And some people couldn't stay awake. And some people clapped and sang off key. And some sang, I mean, it was, it was this, this great party of people praising the Lord. But one of the things that I learned there is that so many of them were abandoned and so many of them were so lonely because they never got any care from their children. And so uh, Timothy, or Paul says to Timothy, no, 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 that's, Christians, that's not, that's not what you do. That's not what, put, don't give me all this, I love Jesus, but you're not, you're, you've abandoned your parents stuff. Okay, that doesn't work. You want to put your religion into practice, this is what it looks like. Well, let's move to commandment number six. We've looked at number five, honoring your father and mother. Number six is very short. It says, do not murder. Now, there isn't a whole lot to say about this commandment. And I don't think our congregation, as far as I know, has a huge problem. People struggling with want to murder other people. And you might say, but Nathan, you don't know my family. I struggle with this commandment every day. Now, remember that as Christians, we don't follow the Ten Commandments. We follow the fulfilled Ten Commandments. And so um, our command is... Don't hate and don't take revenge. The Old Testament would say don't murder, but we would go further and say don't hate, don't take revenge, because then you won't murder. Now look what Jesus said about this. He said, you have heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. Paul also says in Romans 12, do not repay anyone evil for evil. Try to do what is honorable in everyone's eyes. If possible, on your part, live at peace with everyone. Friends, do not avenge yourselves. Instead, leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, Vengeance belongs to me. I will repay, says the Lord. But if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For in doing so, you will be heaping fiery coals upon his head. Do not be conquered by evil, but conquer evil with good. So the fulfilled sixth commandment is not to refrain from murder, but to refrain from hate and revenge, because if we don't hate and we don't have revenge in our hearts, then we can't murder. But here's the second question I have is, why is murder wrong? Now, there's some obvious reasons, but I want to look at this theologically. Why would it be wrong to, to murder someone who murdered someone, you know, a family member or did something horrible to me? Well, the first thing is what theologians call the imago Dei. It's a Latin term, a theological term. It means the image of God. The imago Dei is the image of God. It's from Genesis 1.26, and it simply says that God made humankind in his own image. That contrary to what we've heard, there is a difference between us and an animal or a bug or a snake. That the image of God is placed in us, and that means we have intrinsic value, not practical value. You see, practical value says, well, as long as you can contribute, then you're valuable. But if you are um, an unwanted baby, if you're um, a senior who, who's costing lots of money to the health care system, if you are a special need or some kind of handicap, then you are practically not valuable, and so we need to eliminate these sorts of people. But the scripture teaches us that because we were made in his image, we have intrinsic value that is not based upon what we can produce 
or what people's opinions are of us, we have intrinsic value. And so when we murder, we take away that which God has created. The second reason we know murder is wrong is simply because he declared it wrong. It's that simple. You remember the story where Cain killed his brother Abel in Genesis chapter uh, 4? It's an interesting thing that by this time, they were already learning to do sacrifices. They were learning to sacrifice animals, and the way they would do it is they would take an animal, pull its head back, and slice its throat open. And when the blood came out, it would be that that sacrifice, that took my sin away. Well, Cain, there had never been murder in the world. Cain had never seen murder. And so we guess that he did it the way they did sacrifices. He probably clubbed his brother, brother over the head, pulled back his head, and slit his throat. And the Lord said that his blood cries out from the ground. And so the Lord declared this to be wrong, murder. But the third thing is that revenge clouds our judgment. When someone has wronged you, you are not the person to carry out revenge. I, I heard a, I saw a video, you know, online, they always have these stupid videos. Look what happened in this city. There's always some video. Well, I saw a video of a preschool where there was a toddler sitting in a chair. And when the teacher left the room, there was an older kid, maybe five years old. He starts punching the toddler in the face. So this poor little toddler, it's a girl, she's sitting there, and this boy comes up and just starts socking this girl in the face. And she starts screaming, the teacher comes in, and then the boy turns around, he's like, well, I don't know, she just, he was really being manipulative. She walks out again, so he socks her in the face a couple more times, and finally they figured out what was happening. Well, the dad hears about this. Now, I don't know about you, but, but the raging bull instinct would come out. So this dad just kicked open the preschool door, went in there, found the kid that did this, and just started beating the heck out of this kid. And you might say, well, it's illegal, it's not good, but the kid deserved it, except for the dad and his anger beat the wrong kid. Yeah. Poor kid, man. When, when we take this stuff into our own hands... Our judgment gets clouded because of the anger. Now, here's the last question I want to look at, and it's, it's this. Can Christians, are Christians allowed to kill? Should we be pacifists? And so my answer, and you might not agree with me, not everyone takes my view, but my answer is, can Christians kill? In short, the answer is yes. Now, let me, let me explain and let me read this. This is from Ecclesiastes. You've probably heard this in the song from back in the day. There is a time for everything and a season for every activity under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to uproot, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to tear down and a time to build. And then he goes on at the end to say, a time to hate and a time for war. And people will say, Nathan, I thought Christians were supposed to be pacifists. Well, according to the Old Testament, capital punishment was allowed. And so I think that as Christians, there's nothing wrong with us supporting capital punishment. Now, you might not like the system because in California it costs so much money. You might not like the way they go about it. But to be a Christian and to support capital punishment is not wrong. But it might be wrong if the system is corrupt and it's not working. There's also times where Christians have to fight in a war. And I know that there's a lot of opinions about our wars. The Vietnam is a controversial war. The war in Iraq was a controversial war. And depending upon your side of the political spectrum, you might not view the war as a just war. And that is a decision that you will have to make in your relationship with God. But there's one last one, and that is self-defense. I am going to defend my family from people who would break into my house. Now, in Romans 12, 8, it says, notice the clause, as far it, as it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live in peace with everyone. Amen. So we ought to be peacemakers, but if someone's breaking into my house in the middle of the night and trying to harm myself or my family, then I'm going to take those matters into my own hands. Now, some will say, but wait a minute, Nathan, I've read Matthew chapter 5, verse 39, and I know what it says. Whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn the other to him also. 
And so this verse basically says that if someone's going to harm you, let them harm you. I disagree. This isn't referencing a harm. This is referencing an insult. If you're out in public and someone just slaps you in the face to insult you, then you take that. You don't retaliate. They're not trying to harm you. They're trying to embarrass you. I don't think this is referring to some freaky looking guy in a clown outfit breaks through your window and you're and he says i want your wife and children okay i'm going to turn the other cheek you can have them no this is not what it's referring to and others will say wait a minute nathan i've looked at john 18 look what it says simon peter then having a sword drew it and struck the high priest's slave and cut off his right ear the slave's name was malchus so Jesus said to Peter, put the sword into the sheath, the cup which the Father has given me, shall I not drink it? In other words, Peter, don't be chopping off people's ears. Was it because he was defending Jesus, or was it because this was a part of the plan? Jesus was supposed to be arrested, supposed to be crucified, and Peter was getting in the way. So this wasn't a, a reference to us being pacifists. Look. I would conclude that Christians are supposed to be peacemakers. We ought to abhor violence, but when the need arises, self-defense and war must be waged to avoid the greater atrocities of evil. This is command five and six, honor your parents, don't murder, don't hate, don't take revenge. And you might look at these commands and you might say, these are hard to live out. It's hard for me to honor my mother and father. It's hard for me to respect them. It's hard for me not to hate people and to take revenge. But here's the good thing about these laws. These laws are just pieces of paper. But in the New Testament time, we have something else. You see, when we confess Jesus as Lord and Savior, it tells us that his spirit comes into us and from the inside out he empowers us so that when we live with him and we walk with him he gives us power to do the things that we could not do if they were just written down in a rule book and so when i couldn't obey or couldn't honor my mother and father before because i have confessed christ as lord and he has filled me he's given me the power to do that and when I hated people in my life, hated, wanted to take revenge, wanted to cause harm in, res in response to the harm that was given to me, when I felt those things and I didn't have the power to, to refrain because I've invited Christ into my life, he's filled me with his spirit, he also gives me the power to obey those commands. And so here's the question I have for you. Has he come into your life? Has he changed your life? Because without that, these are just things written down, and you won't have the power to obey them.